Okay, we're going to move into the afternoon session, which is the uh, C. difficile MDRO, MRSA, Lab ID event, and Inpatient Surveillance module. My name is Denise Leaptrot, and uh, along with my colleague Dominique Godfrey, who we're going to uh, welcome you to the South. <laughs> <laughs> you will hear a nice uh, cadence of Southern influence over the next couple of hours, and we hope you understand this well. And we're going to try to uh, present this module in a way that makes that possible. Uh, we're going to be tag teaming, and so I'm going to start off, and Dominique will step up shortly and uh, offer some additional information. So when I was preparing for our presentation today, I met with my mentors who has done adult education for many, many years, and we got into a good conversation about what's the best way to educate adults. And she said, you know, I like to think of my students as blank pages. She said the problem with adult learners is they want to get in the express lane immediately. Uh, they want to get from A to Z in 0 0.5 seconds. And adult education is a little bit different from that respect. You have to take it at a steady pace and go through steps. So I'm going to ask you to make yourself a blank, a blank page, insert your best photo here, and I will tell you that elevator to success is out of order, and it's a permanent disorder. So we're going to have to use the stairs and we're going to go through the MDRO module one step at a time. So here are our goals that we are setting for ourselves today. I think they'll be familiar to you. But we certainly want to help you understand MDRO, Infection Surveillance and LAPD Event Reporting. Um, I'm going to show you some navigation tips for the website so that you can reference the print the tools that we have available for you. Uh, we're going to go over definitions and the protocols and show you how to enter events and uh, denominator data, which seems to be one of the more problematic parts of uh, our protocol. And then we're going to touch briefly on some analysis because you have a lot to look forward to this afternoon. You have an entire session devoted to uh, lab ID event analysis, which will follow this session. So let's get started, and one of the first things that I'd like to do is just share with you some of the emails that I get from users. And one of the more common questions is, where do I find the MDR protocol, and how do I know what is required to be reported at my facility? So we have kind of a standard answer for this. Um, here is the link that will take you directly to the um, Chapter 12 MDRO MRSA C. difficile protocol page. And when you get to that, you will offer opportunities to open up very and sundry tabs. The first one you'll see here is a red arrow going to protocols. And then the second arrow is to CMS supporting materials. If you open up the protocols, the red box here offers you a link to printing the protocol. Now, I know we all live in an electronic age, and I like to pull up things electronically as much as the next person. But remember, every year we review and we modify our protocols. And once a new protocol is posted, the prior year's protocol is taken down and moved to a different section of the web page, which users have said it's more difficult for them to find. So I like to tell everybody, Take the opportunity to print a hard copy of your protocol so that you have that available for you uh, going forward. These questions kind of come up mostly around the first of the year when you're still doing some surveillance for the prior year, but you're also starting surveillance for the new year. The second uh, arrow is to the CMS reporting um, tab. And here's the answer to what do I, how do I know what to select or what is required for reporting. As I've told many users, NHSN doesn't tell you what types of reporting you have to do. You tell us on your monthly reporting plan what kind of data to expect. And 
there are other organizations that can be used to determine whether or not you're meeting specific reporting requirements. CMS is one of our collaborating organizations, and they have made available to us some documents that we're happy to post. So if you are participating in a CMS reporting program, you can go to this link, and you can find exactly what CMS requires you to report for a particular reporting program. I understand there are many states that have reporting requirements. Uh, there are some organizations, some healthcare systems that have reporting requirements. You might want to consider all of that if it fits you, but NHSN doesn't tell you what to report. We simply look for data based on what you tell us you will be reporting. If you pull up that CMS document, here is uh, the timeline of what is and included in which particular reporting programs. Just to simplify, for lab ID event reporting, if you work in acute care, you work in long-term acute care, if you work in uh, a rehab facility, if you work in a PPS cancer exempt hospital, MRSA bacteremia and C. difficile lab ID events are required reporting to satisfy the CMS program. This is done at the fact wide end level, which I will tell you includes emergency departments and 24 hour observation locations. And when you give us that data, each quarter we will compile, compile it and we will send to CMS the analysis on your behalf. So the other part of uh, the tab that I wanted to point out is our frequently asked questions. We, you know, this protocol is pretty lengthy. Anybody printed up the protocol ever? <laughs> so it's like 40 plus pages. Um, and we really don't have every little thing you need to know about reporting in the protocol, even at that length. So we put together frequently asked question documents, which is noted here. Uh, I will just tell you, they are gonna have a little bit of a different look this year. Don't, don't get overwhelmed with it. It is very good information still, and it's based on questions that we get frequently from users. Uh, it's just formatted a little different. So if you get a chance, I'd like for you to check that out. Here is the current safety uh, component modules. As you see over here on the very end is the MDRO and CDI module. I will tell you we have a couple of new modules coming down the pike, so this graphic will probably change uh, by the time we do this again next year. If you open up the protocol and you look just at the MDRO chapter, we offer quite a varied type of monitoring within this one protocol. We have infection surveillance that can be done. We have lab ID event reporting. And then we have process and prevention measures and outcome measures. And you can choose any combination of these individually at the facility level. I'm gonna talk about our definitions for MDROs. And the reason I'm gonna do this is because I'm hearing from users that many facilities have very specific definitions for MDROs at the facility level, and that is just fine. But if you elect to participate in a specific MDRO reporting through NHSN, you need to use our definition for reporting. Um, and I have moved MRSA and C. difficile up to the top of the list because that's the ones that are reported most frequently, but we have seven different categories for reporting, uh, which I've just run through here. I'm not gonna take the time to read them. I will tell you that I often get questions about other organisms that are considered MDRO at the facility level that are not one of these seven. For NHSN purposes, these are the seven that are available for use, which is not to say you can't track other MDROs at the facility level, but only these seven are reportable for tracking within NHSN. I want to speak just briefly about infection surveillance of MDROs. So 
The Lab ID event piece to the reporting module gets the majority of the attention because it is involved in some required reporting programs uh, from the CMS perspective. But I do know there's increased interest in tracking certain MDROs from an infection surveillance perspective. So I wanted to just illustrate that you do have the capability within the application to perform infection surveillance for a particular MDRO or to perform infection surveillance and lab ID event reporting together for a particular MDRO. I've used CRE here and it, this is from your monthly reporting plan. I, I think you would recognize it. And this is a drop down menu and you would choose the MDRO of interest. Make sure if you want to do infection surveillance, that this box is checked. If you're already doing lab ID event, you just need to make sure your infection surveillance is also checked. So what is the difference here in what you might normally see on your, your reporting plan? Oh, I'm just going to tell you, you look like that deer in the headlight thing. Uh, <laughs> if you're going to do infection surveillance, it must be by individual location. Back wide in is an option strictly for lab ID event reporting. So you would select whatever units you are interested in following, and you would select those here. Here's one for C. difficile. I wanted to point this out so that uh, there's no misunderstanding that there is a C. difficile infection surveillance monitoring available in addition to C. difficile lab ID event reporting. If you were going to do any type of infection surveillance of any MDRO, you would use Chapter 17 definitions as well as the other chapters available within the Patient Safety Component Manual. This is the C. difficile infection criteria from page 1719, which is our surveillance definitions chapter. Um, we have just the past few years devised a specific CDI infection criteria, and this is what it looks like right now. And I'm just throwing this up to make you aware that this does live in the protocol. There is a comparison of lab ID event reporting and infection surveillance and the differences. Uh, just in case you've never seen it, uh, wanted to make sure you knew about that. All right, so let's move on into lab ID event reporting, which is where we're going to spend a, uh, a good bit of time. So the purpose of the lab ID event reporting is to monitor MDROs and C. difficile so that you can identify trends and changes. It helps you identify your community incidents as well as your healthcare onset incidents. And it helps inform you where to put your resources. We know that IPs are limited and that you have to make the best use of your time as you can. So we're hoping that the data that you collect from the lab ID reporting mechanism uh, will help target your prevention methods. And here are some advantages or what we feel are advantages to lab ID event reporting. Uh, I think more commonly today, people probably are appreciating the standardized case definition so that you know you are compared to other facilities of a like nature in the very same manner. And again, you're going to get more on analysis a little later. So as I mentioned earlier, it's very important for you to realize that back wide in is an option strictly for lab ID event reporting. And back wide in is going to include all of your inpatient locations plus the emergency department and your dedicated 24-hour observation locations. We recognize that the emergency department and a 24-hour observation location is an outpatient location from a mapping perspective, but it does fall under the fact wide end umbrella. So you want to make sure that you make that connection. Uh, please remember that we do have baby-based location exclusions for C. difficile reporting. There is one exception for fact wide end reporting. As we all know, our guidance is to report 
the specimen or report the event for the location where the positive specimen is collected. Uh, there is one special exception. If you have a specimen collected from an affiliated outpatient location outside of the ED or the dedicated 24-hour observation location, and that patient admits as an inpatient to the facility that same calendar day, you can report the outpatient specimen as an inpatient event for the admitting location. So the question always comes to me, I get two questions about this. They say, what is an affiliated outpatient location? So I've tried to put you a little bit of guidance here on the slide about affiliated outpatient locations. Basically, it has to be a, an affiliated uh, to your facility and use the same type of track patient identifier so that they can be tracked across scopes of services. The other thing that I, I get is, um, what if they come to the ED, they're in the outpatient setting, and they come to the ED the same calendar day? Can I report an event in that circumstance? What do you think? This isn't really a question for your clickers, but what do you think? Well, no, you can't, because those are both outpatient locations. So it's only if the patient admits to an inpatient location on the same calendar day. Um, once we get the information on your lab ID events, the application is gonna automatically categorize the, those events. So it is important that you give us all of your events, whether they are community onset events, whether they're healthcare onset events, whether they occur in a inpatient location with a different CCN, when you are doing basic fact wide in reporting, you need to give us all of the specimens that meet the definitions for lab ID events in whatever locations are available in your facility. Uh, the CCN issue comes into play in analysis, and we'll talk more about that. But just remember, if you have an inpatient rehab or an inpatient behavioral health that operates under a a different CCN or a unique CCN from your acute care facility, those units are still inpatient locations for the acute care facility. So they are included in fact wide end reporting. So let's look at locations very briefly. And I'm gonna go through this very quickly because uh, we're gonna spend a little more time on that later. But if you wanna see how your locations are mapped, I just wanna remind you to go to uh, the locations tab and just look to see what you already have in place. Um, I've always said that you need to visit this page at least on an annual basis so that you can ensure that all of your locations are mapped appropriately. We have a whole chapter, chapter 15 locations, to give you guidance on how to map particular locations. If you have changes in service, uh, you have closures, you need to edit and to correct so that you have the most appropriate locations available for event reporting because you cannot submit a lab ID event without giving us a location of attribution. So how are we going to do lab ID event reporting? So we're gonna start with the monthly reporting plan, which is important and you'll hear a lot about it. You've already heard a little bit about it today, but the monthly reporting plan is what tells us what to expect from you. And again, we're not gonna tell you what to mark on your, your plan, but we get it and we look at it and we expect data based on what you tell us. Uh, it also lets us know how we can do our analysis, and that includes what we can share with CMS. You have to enter a plan for every month of the year, and we're only submitting data for complete months. So pay attention to your alerts. If you get alerts, you need to try to figure out what the alert is telling you and clear those alerts so that your monthly data reporting is complete and it can be included in the analysis section. If you're gonna do lab ID event reporting, you're gonna do it under the FACWIDE-N umbrella. Um, 
Remember that the emergency departments and the 24-hour observation locations, although they are outpatient locations, they are under the FACWIDE-N umbrella. Now, when you're putting together your monthly reporting plan, I know Scott mentioned earlier in his presentation that you could use the copy from previous months button and it will replicate from that point forward. And that is absolutely fine. If you are totally confident that you have everything on your reporting plan that needs to be there, you can use that copy from previous months button. But we ran into a little trouble back uh, a little while ago when we added the emergency department and the 24-hour observation locations to the FACWIDE umbrella. Ran into trouble with facilities not having that on their plan, doing copy from previous months, and it would, was missing. So just make sure if you're going to use that copy button, it's right. If not, add it manually. Uh, I'm going to fly through this because we pretty well have already covered that, but you're going to add a monthly reporting plan every month. You're going to put in FACWIDE in as your location, and you're going to choose your particular organism. And once you do that, this is what your monthly reporting plan looks like if you just have inpatient locations in your facility. If you have ED, and 24-hour observation locations, you will have rows on your monthly reporting plan that match your FACWIDE in row. So for here, we have MRSA Lab ID events. You come down to the observation location. You have Lab ID events, uh, blood specimens only. And then you come down to the emergency department for MRSA and you have Lab ID blood specimens only, and the same for the C. difficile. The application will match those up for you if uh, you put in FACWIDE in and you have emergency department and 24-hour observation mapped in your facility, the application will automatically add those for you. If they're already on there and you hit copy from previous months, they're already on there. Just make sure that those rows appear if you have those locations in your facility. If you have an inpatient rehab unit, it will not automatically populate on your monthly reporting plan. You have to add those rows yourself manually. So you wanna make sure that if you're doing, if you have an inpatient rehab unit that operates under a separate CCN from the acute care facility, that you have dedicated reporting rows on your monthly reporting plan under the MDRO section. For lab ID event, blood specimens only for MRSA, and lab ID event, all specimens for C. difficile. And this is what a reporting plan looks like for a facility who's doing fact white in that has emergency department, observation unit, and inpatient rehab. So you can see that your monthly reporting plan can get pretty lengthy. If you're doing any type of MDRO outside of MRSA and C. difficile, it can get very, very lengthy, depending on how many units you want to monitor. So let's talk C. difficile now. This is a hot topic everywhere, I think. So we're gonna start with the definition as it is found in the protocol. And I copied this directly from the protocol, a positive laboratory test result for C. difficile toxin A and or B includes molecular assays like PCR and or toxin assays tested on an unformed stool specimen. Let's just stop right there for a minute. <laughs> ah, now you laugh. <laughs> okay, so all lab ID event definitions are based on a positive laboratory result without any clinical consideration. So you were going to your lab, or perhaps you have it set up so that your lab is sending to you directly all of their positive findings. For C. difficile, our expectation is that if the specimen is tested, it meets the unformed stool definition. We're going to come back to that because there's more, right? <laughs> That's a big, big uh, sticky point. 
But the definition itself has not changed. We're not looking at any kind of clinical consideration. So if the patient admits with diarrhea, that's, that's an indication perhaps that they would consider testing for C. difficile. But it does not directly play a role in whether you meet the definition for the C. difficile lab ID event. You've got to have that positive laboratory test. And so we go on. Uh, we do have a mechanism for when you're not using things like toxin testing and molecular assays, uh, if you're doing traditional cultures, or if you have some sort of new and innovative way that you're testing for C. difficile, because boy, I get emails pretty much on a weekly basis about some sort of new method for identification of C. difficile. The thing to remember is you have to go back and you have to look at this definition. You have to decide whether or not what you're seeing from your laboratory meets what this definition is saying to you. Remember, we are excluding baby-based locations. So that would be your nurseries, your NICUs, your step-down nurseries, anything that is traditionally a baby location. ID, uh, C. difficile lab ID event reporting really is by patient and location. It's got nothing to do with age. But uh, because of the scientific literature on babies, we do exclude those locations, uh, but not based on age specifically. So we're going to talk more and more about this because there is a lot of misunderstanding or there's a lot of questions, I would say, about how do you meet this C. difficile lab ID test result finding. There are a lot of facilities who have moved to new and innovative ways to identify C. difficile, including using multi-step testing methods for identification. NHSN does not endorse, nor does it make any recommendations on a specific type of testing methodology. We feel like facilities need to have the flexibility to choose the method of testing that best suits your resources and or suits the goal that you have for C. difficile testing. So the multi-step testing method algorithms are um, challenging in and of themselves. We've heard from a lot of facilities that they are thinking of moving in this direction and they kind of would like some better guidance on what would be the ramifications if a move was made. So we decided that we did not want to change the actual definition of a CDI laboratory assay. And we felt like adding a clarifying note for multi-step testing would be the at least a beginning in where we need to go with this uh, issue. So this is the note that was added directly beneath the CDI laboratory assay definition in the protocol. And it says, when using a multi-testing methodology for C. diff identification, the final result of the last test finding is going to be what you are going to look at to determine if you're meeting the CDI laboratory assay definition. So very quickly, after we published the new protocol, <laughs> I started getting questions on this. And one of the first emails that I got said, so unfortunately, my physicians don't stop at a single test. They order C. difficile like every two or three days. Uh, so she said, are you telling me that I just need to use that last test result to decide whether or not I have an ID event? And the answer to that is no. <laughs> um, first off, there are lots of facilities that are not using a multi-step algorithm. So this note will change nothing for those facilities. If you are using just a single step test, keep doing everything the same way you've been doing. If you're using a multi-step algorithm, what we want you to do is on each individual laboratory result that you receive on the patient, look to see which is the 
last test performed and what that result tells you. So if you have a patient who has five different specimens submitted for C. diff testing, you have to look at five different laboratory results to determine if you have five different events. Uh, we do not direct patient care, so we can't help you with those physicians who like to reorder, other than I'll share with you my ID physician when I work boots on the grounds told me it's like being pregnant. You either have it or you don't. So <laughs> I will throw that out. So let's look at examples. And I'm just going to share two. And I'm going to go ahead and warn you when we get ready to have questions, you need to email me. If you want me to make a determination on your specific facility algorithm reports, uh, I can't do that at the microphone. But I'm going to give you a couple examples to work off of. So here is example one. So this facility uses the traditional EIA testing. And when they get an antigen positive and a toxin negative, they will follow that with a PCR for discrepant results. In this case, the PCR is the last test performed, and the PCR result will determine whether or not you meet the CDI laboratory assay definition. Since the PCR is positive in this example, this finding does represent a lab ID event and should be reported as such. All right, so let's flip that. So they do the PCR first, and it's positive. And then they follow that with the EIA test, and they get antigen positive and toxin negative. The toxin negative test is the last test performed in this multi-step algorithm. Therefore, it is the test result used to determine whether you meet the lab ID event definition. The toxin is negative, so this would not be a lab ID event. And I am stopping with just those two examples, and I'm really happy that you don't have any leftover lunch to throw at me. <laughs> Here's a, just a graphic for identifying CDI lab ID events. Uh, I know a lot of people are more visual learners, uh, so I put this together to just kind of help you, and it's in your handout for you to pull out and have for future reference. So let's talk a little bit about form stool, because I also get lots of questions about, yeah, I know we're not supposed to test anything but unformed stool, but what do we do if we have a test result on a form stool? So, Part of the CDI laboratory assay definition includes a requirement that the testing be performed on an unformed stool specimen. If your test is not performed on the appropriate type specimen, it is not valid for meeting the CDI laboratory definition. Uh, we, we recommend that all of your testing laboratories have a rejection protocol in place where only the appropriate specimens are tested. If they receive an inappropriate specimen, such as a form stool, they would be rejected and not tested. I know some facilities have even uh, two or three different levels. They have you know, facility-wide protocols for specimens where they would only say, you can't, you can't even send a specimen unless it's unformed. But I do think that the clinicians at the laboratory level um, are in a good spot to be able to reject those inappropriate specimens. If you have a rejection protocol in place and that specimen is tested, you should feel confident that the right or the appropriate type of specimen was submitted and the results are valid. Um, there might be a little bit of a learning curve to determining what is appropriate for testing. There are various different algorithms out there for laboratories to use for identifying what is 
unformed. I liked the Bristol School chart just because that's the one I used most when I did this work. Um, but any good guidance on classifying stools would be appropriate. The rejection policy can really help you from the IP perspective. You should only be looking at that laboratory result. You know, we don't want you going into the chart looking to see if you can find any kind of documentation that this is not the right type of specimen. That is not a good use of your time. You should be able to get a line listing from your, report, uh, from your laboratory or laboratory reports, and on that laboratory report, it should tell you you have a stool specimen, and if they don't say it was formed, you should be confident that that is a good report and it's usable for meeting the CDI definition. Okay, so let's see if you're listening. Pull out your clickers. This is a polling question, not intended to be particularly difficult, uh, but this is our friend Janet who came to the ER with a complaint of an ankle pain following a flag football tackle. She had a fracture and went to surgery for an ORIF, and they used Levaquin for prophylaxis. So she has a fever in the air recovery room, and they admit her for observation and continue Levaquin for 48 hours. She's still there on hospital day four, begins to have abdominal pain and diarrhea, and then on hospital day five, a loose stool is submitted for C. difficile testing, and the report is called back as PCR positive. So, if you are a facility who is participating in C. difficile lab ID event reporting under the FACWIDE in umbrella, would you report this hospital, I think that should be hospital day five, a PCR laboratory result as a lab ID event? I think, let me go back. Didn't we say that was five? Typo, 30 lashes with a limp noodle. Um, all right, so here are your choices, A, B, C, or D. I'm not gonna read them. I'm gonna tell you that polling is open. Whoa. <laughs> It said polling is cold, Cheryl, what happened? <laughs> All right, y'all vote. See if it'll work, I don't know. <laughs> it tells me polling is closed. I'm not really sure what that's all about. Uh, yes, I'll admit it, not technology savvy. <laughs> okay, well, let's move on, we'll see. Everybody thinks it's B, and everybody's right. Give yourself a pat on the back. <laughs> yes. This is the first positive lab finding for the patient and the location. Remember, lab ID reporting is by patient and location, and you're always reporting the first positive specimen for the patient in the location. We do have a 14-day rule that is location-specific. So if you have a patient who stays in the same location during their entire hospitalization, and you are collecting specimens at least every 14 days, you will only be reporting one lab ID event. But when the patient changes location, the 14-day rule resets, starts over. All right, so once you uh, know you have an event, you're going to add that into uh, the application. Here is the event form from the outpatient side. I will just point out here that if you're gonna be reporting from your ED in your 24 hour observation, you have to say outpatient equal yes, so that your drop down menu will show your outpatient locations. Um, your sources, autofill, everything that is in yellow highlighted red asterisk is required. If it is not, it's optional. And this question will autofill based on prior submitted data for any completed prior month. So if you've got, you're doing January monitoring and you have two events in January and the first one occurs on January the 1st and the second occurs on January the 15th, they are both gonna have the same answer in this box because it only looks at prior completed months and your January data will not be available until that month is done. I get that question often. 
Here's the event from the inpatient side, very similar. Just again, if you're going to be reporting an inpatient event, outpatient equal no, so that you get in your drop down menu under location all of your inpatient locations. Once you have given us your events, the application will automatically categorize based on dates, specifically the date of admission to the facility and the date of event or the date of positive specimen. These categories that you see here, the healthcare facility onset, the community onset, the community onset, healthcare facility associated, are all strictly date driven. Remember, events are viewed independently. At this level of categorization, every event is looked at on its own merit. There is no comparison to any other events that may or may not be in place for this patient. So a healthcare facility onset or an HO event is any lab ID event specimen collected on or after hospital day four. That's it cut and dried, doesn't matter if you had a prior positive or not. If the event occurs after, on or after hospital day four, it is an HO event. Uh, community onset is outpatient locations are automatically given your community onset designation and then inpatient events on hospital day one, two, or three. Your COHICFA or your community onset healthcare facility associated requires that the uh, lab ID event be collected from a patient discharged from the facility less than or equal to four weeks prior from the date of the current event. That is specifically 28 days from the current event, from the event that you are submitting, and it has to be a prior positive in your facility. Remember, NHSN reporting is by single facility. The application just simply doesn't have the capability of searching across facilities for events. We only look at the events for your facility. Co uh, the COHIC for categorization is a subset of the community onset categorization. So if you have an event that occurs on hospital day six and the patient was in your hospital and discharged last week, what do you think they get? They don't get COHICFA. <laughs> Before you can apply COHICFA, you have to first meet the community onset categorization. So that means COHICFA events can only be in an outpatient location or an inpatient event on hospital day one, two, or three with a prior discharge of 28 days. There are actually two categories uh, assigned two levels of categorization assigned to each lab ID event. Uh, during the analysis of your C. difficile events, there, the incident lab ID event or the recurrent lab ID event categorization is applied. And um, I'm not gonna get into this very deeply because again, you're gonna hear more about that later on, but the incident event is gonna be the first event for the patient for uh, the facility or one that is occurring more than 56 days from a prior positive. And then the recurrent event is gonna be an event from a specimen that's greater than 14 days, but less than 57 days from uh, the most recent CDI event. So there's a little gap, you may notice, there's a little gap between incident and recurrent. If you have a patient who has uh, CDI, lab ID events, submitted within 14 days, you really don't get any assignment at this categorization level. And Lindsay's gonna tell you all about that a little bit later on. And remember, just to, reporting is by single facility, so all we have is your facility data to compare to. And if that recurrent event is not in your facility, then we can't assign a recurrent categorization. Here's the line listing, and I just wanted to point out, for those of you who are often wondering where to go to look for your categorization, here are the two 
columns that will give you your CO, your HO, your COHIPFA, and your INSEN, and your recurrent. And as you can see here, you have a blank CDI assay value on this because it's within 14 days of a prior positive. I'm just throwing this up here because a lot of people say, I don't know where that CMS report is you keep telling me about. <laughs> um, I'm going to leave all of this to, to Lindsay, but I did want to show you the steps that you can go through to pull up the CMS reports. And this is exactly what we would submit to CMS on your behalf each quarter. So let's just skim through real quickly and review. For fact white in, C. difficile toxin positive specimens are from all inpatient locations, including the ED and the 24-hour observation location, but not baby-based locations. You give us all of your lab ID events, CO, HO, COHIPFA, whatever they are, you give them to us and we categorize them. Only loose stools should be tested for C. difficile. And a C. difficile positive test finding on a loose stool specimen qualifies as a lab ID event if this is the final test finding and there has not been a previous positive laboratory result for the patient at a location within the previous 14 days for that patient and that location. And I am going to turn it over to Dominique, and she is going to teach you about MRSA bacteremia. So Denise did a great job, and so you're in for a real treat with the MRSA portion of lab ID reporting. Um, we'll start with what's really in a name, and this is the forgotten organism, MRSA. I don't know why other MDROs get all the fame. Compared to me, they're a close second, and technically speaking, really lame. Causing havoc in the community and hospitals, now that's my game. All IPs should really know my name. And so that's MRSA, and VRE felt the same way when MRSA came along, and now CDF came along, and MRSA is has been thrown to the wayside. But we'll talk about it for a little bit as it pertains to MRSA bacteremia lab ID event reporting. So any MRSA blood specimen that's obtained for clinical decision-making purposes will fit the lab ID event definition, and this will exclude your screening culture, such as those used for active surveillance testing. MRSA positive blood specimens are for a patient in a location with no prior MRSA positive blood specimen that is collected within 14 days for the patient and in that specific location. And your lab ID event will be your first MRSA positive blood for the patient in the location. All initial MRSA blood isolates for the location, excluding, again, those that are being used for active surveillance culturing. So let's look at the definition of a unique blood source. And this is also found in the manual. And it's simply stating there should be a full 14 days with no positive blood culture result for the patient for that particular MDRO, in this case MRSA, and location before another lab ID event is entered into NHSN for the patient, for the MDRO, as well as for that location. Blood isolates that are collected within 14 days for the same patient and MDRO and location are considered duplicates. If you are following all specimens, the first MDRO for the patient, the month, and location should be reported. And please note that calendar day one is uh, the date of the specimen collection. So I want to draw attention to the MDRO and CDI lab ID event calculator. And I, the link is included in, uh, in your handouts, and I've just highlighted that link there. So what you'll find when you're entering in, or when you're trying to use the lab ID calculator to determine if a lab ID, if you have a lab ID event, you'd select the organism, in this case MRSA. You'd select blood specimens only if it is a positive blood culture or if you're following blood specimens only. 
and then you put in the month and the reporting year. Um, you can use generic locations or you can feel free to type in your own, but the ge generic, using generic locations will provide you with the same determination. And in this example, I've entered in an MRSA positive blood culture, which occurred on February 4th, and it was in our med surge unit. And then you have another one on 2 on 211. And note, if you were trying or thinking, well, should I enter this into NHSN? The lab ID calculator will provide you with this message, which just simply states, this is not the first positive lab ID blood specimen type within the last 14 days, and therefore this is not a reportable event. So that's one of the benefits of using the lab ID event calculator. This is just an algorithm that's adapted from figure one for the MDRO testing. And it's just simply going through, if you have a positive blood um, specimen, blood isolate, and if it's been less than two weeks, then you determine whether you have a, la a duplicate lab ID event, or if it's been greater than two weeks, then you would determine if in fact, you do have a lab ID event. If it is a duplicate MDRO test, this is not a lab ID event. You would not enter it into NHSN. If it's a non-duplicate, you would enter that event into NHSN. So now let's look at submitting a lab ID event, entering into NHSN for your outpatient locations. It's the same, just as Denise stated, if you see an asterisk beside the field, then that is a required field and it must be completed. So you would do outpatient, if it was in an outpatient location, your emergency departments, emergency rooms, depending on the part of the country you're in, or your 24 hour observation, you would enter yes. This would bring, this would provide a drop down box for all of your locations that you have mapped in your facility that are considered outpatient locations. With MRSA lab ID event reporting, it is very important to choose these specific selections. So the specimen body site slash source must read cardiovascular, circulatory, lymphatics, and the specimen source that you would select would be a blood specimen. Oftentimes we get questions, we entered in an MRSA lab ID event and we can't find it. What happened to it? We do not take them away. Chances are you may have entered in the wrong specimen body site source or the incorrect specimen source. And then this last question, Denise highlighted this. It's, it auto fills uh, using prior submitted data. So in this example, if you're monitoring lab ID, MRSA lab ID events for the month of March and it's March 15th and you have an event, but you know that you put an a event in previously on March 1st and you're wondering why that answer is no. In my case, it was yes. So I've completed February, I had an event, so it populated yes. It's because it's the prior completed month. Now let's look at inpatient. Same thing, when you go to um, select whether it's an outpatient or not, you would say no. The location is all of your mapped inpatient locations. So you choose the location of where the positive blood culture was collected. Again, please make sure that you choose the correct specimen body site source and then the correct specimen source. And this last field will auto populate based on the reporting month that you are in. If you have a positive on March 1st, let's use that example again, and another positive on March 15th, that field will read no. Once Mar the month of March is completed, perhaps you have another in April, that field will change and it would all auto populate to read yes. So categorization of MRSA lab events, NHSN categorizes events as community onset, and that's if you have a specimen collected in an outpatient location, so again, your ED or your 24-hour <coughs> OB locations, 
or in an inpatient location less than three days after admission to the facility. So we're talking hospital day one, two, or three. Your healthcare facility onset is allowed by the event where the specimen is collected greater than three days after admission, so on or after hospital day four. So during analysis, your unique blood source would be your first positive MRSA for the patient for the admission or the first positive greater than 15 days. So keep in mind that 14-day time frame. Subsequent MRSA events that are, are identified in less than or equal to 14 days in the same location, and that's the key, they must occur in the same location, those are considered duplicate events. Again, looking at categorization of MRSA lab ID events, if you look where I have the arrow, you see the onset, and for MRSA reporting, you'll either see HO, which is your healthcare facility onset, or CO, which would be your community onset events. So in the words of, or paraphrase, from the words of one of the greatest artists of all time, Tina Turner, <laughs> what's location have to do with it? So. <laughs> For inpatient rehab, if you have an inpatient rehab or an inpatient psychiatric facility within your hospital system, NHSN considers transfer to IRFs and IPFs a continuous stay for NHSN reporting purposes, and this is true regardless of the, of the CCN. Facility admission date for lab ID events should reflect the date the patient physically is admitted into an inpatient location for the acute care hospital or the IRF or IPF location, and that's whichever comes first during that hospital stay. So let's look at a question, and this doesn't require any polling. My acute care facility monitors lab ID events and has an inpatient rehab, the inpatient rehab has a unique CCN. The patient has a surgery and post-surgery, there's a direct admit to the rehab unit on 115. The patient has a status change and is transferred to the stroke unit of the acute care facility. He is then discharged to the rehab unit, discharged, excuse me, from the rehab unit on 120 and is readmitted or is admitted to the acute care facility. On 121, there's a positive MRSA blood culture and it is collected on the stroke unit. How should this be reported? So again, from an NHSN perspective, the hospitalization is considered continuous. When submitting the lab ID event, you would submit the date admitted to the facility. And in this case, the patient was admitted on 115. That's the first date the patient enters into the facility. The lab ID event is attributed to the unit or location where the positive blood culture is collected, and that was the stroke unit of the acute care facility. And the unique CCN, or the unique IRF CCN, has no influence on reporting of lab ID events. So let's look at some key points. And this is in no particular order. So the key points here are that this is considered a continuous admission. The date admitted to the facility is the first calendar day the patient is in the system. Events are attributed to the unit where the positive specimen is collected. In this case, that was the stroke unit. And again, the unique CCN is important for CMS analysis, but does not influence reporting on, the, on other acute care facility units. And we'll look at that a little more later um, during the presentation. So now let's look at uh, a few examples. And I see it's saying polling closed, but we'll just move forward. Okay, it's open. So we have Miss, Mrs. Ray or Miss Rainbow Johnson, who was admitted to ICU on 12-5 
While on ICU, she had a positive MRSA blood culture, and this culture was collected on 12-9. After about a week's stay in ICU, she was transferred to IRF on 12-11 for strengthening. While on IRF, she had another positive blood, MRSA blood specimen collected on 12-21. Based on this information, is this a lab ID event for ICU? And we'll wait a few minutes. Oh, please use the clickers. This is a polling question. Okay. So yes, very good. This is a lab ID event for ICU. And let's look at this. So Ms. Johnson was admitted on 12-5. The positive MRSA blood culture was collected on 12-9. The date of collection occurs on or after hospital day four, so this is a lab ID event. Let's look at another example. So Mrs. Johnson was admitted on 12-5. While on ICU, she had the positive MRSA blood culture again collected on 12-9. What is the ICU date of event? This will require your clickers. We'll wait a few minutes. Okay, closing the polls. Yes, you guys are making my day. So the ICU date of event is 12-9. Let's look at this a little closer. Uh -oh. hmm. Okay, well, let's move forward. So remember after a, after a week's stay, in ICU, she was transferred to IRF on 12-11. While on IRF, there was another MRSA positive blood culture collected on 12-21. Based on this information, is this a lab ID event for IRF? And polling is open. Please use your clickers. Okay. Closing the polls. Yes, this is a lab ID event for IRF. Uh-oh. Why? Why? Okay. Tina Turner. <laughs> Tina Turner. I'm telling you. So there was a location change from ICU to IRF. The date of the the date of the transfer was 12/11. The specimen was collected on 12/21. IRF is a different location from ICU. Lab ID reporting is patient and location specific. And this is the first positive for this location and the positive specimens collected on or after hospital day four. Okay, we're okay? Okay, let's move on. So again, let's review. One week stay, she's transferred to she's transferred on 12-11 to IRF. There's another positive MRSA unique blood specimen collected on 12-21. What is the IRF date of event? Poll is open. Okay, closing the poll. Yes, the date of event would be 1221. The date of event for lab ID reporting is the date of collection in the IRF location, and this specimen was collected on 1221. So let's review MRSA bacteremia. 
MRSA blood specimens must be monitored throughout all inpatient locations within the facility, and this would include your EDs and 24-hour observation locations as well. All MRSA lab ID, lab ID events must be entered. That would include those that are community onset as well as those that are healthcare facility onset. A blood specimen will qualify as a lab ID event if there has not been a previous positive laboratory result for the patient and the patient in that location within the previous 14 days. And now Denise will close out by looking at our review and reporting of denominator data. You just thought you were through listening to me. We're gonna talk about denominator data now and we're gonna try to explain it very uh, methodically and simply so that it's well understood by everyone. This tends to be somewhat confusing to a lot of our users and, and denominator data is super important from an analysis standpoint and can really affect your SIR. So we wanna make sure you get this message really well. Um, for every facility, you have to report fact wide in summary denominator data using the MDR and CDI process and outcome measures monthly monitoring tab, number three there. Once you open up this data field, you're going to select your location code as fact wide in, and then your month and your year, and six boxes of data open. And I have those six boxes highlighted. Um, these boxes with the X's on them are grayed out, and I want you to just pretend that they don't even show up because you would not do anything with them and um, we're working to perhaps have those removed in some future uh, iterations of our protocol but for right now we're going to talk about total facility patient days total facility admissions mdro patient days mdro admissions cdi patient days and cdi admissions so this is the same screen that you saw earlier from Scott's presentation. And what is important to recognize is that there are three data rows available and each row is a subset of the row above it. So the first row, row one here, asks for total facility patient days and total facility admissions. This should be the sum of all of your inpatient location patient days and inpatient uh, it, unit admissions. If you need some guidance on how you want to count patient days or how you need to be counting admissions, go to chapter 12, start on page 42, 42, 43, 44, has some examples of how patient days and admissions are counted. But you, this should be your largest count that is entered. If you drop down to row two for MDRO patient days and MDRO admissions, this is the row where we are looking for a count of patients in your facility that are at risk for an MDRO. It is not a count of the patients that you have identified as having an MDRO, for example. So if you have patient care areas that have a unique CCN, like your IRF or your IPF, you would need to remove those counts from the counts submitted here for total facility patient days or total facility admissions. If you are in a facility and you do not have unique CCN units, the counts for MDRO patient days and MDRO admissions will be exactly the same as the count for total facility patient days and total facility admissions. We drop on down to row three, and we're looking at C. difficile patient days and admissions. Again, this is a subset of the row above it. So if you have CCNs, you've already removed those on this line, and you start with this data. You would also remove counts from your baby-based location for CDI patient days 
NICU, nursery, etc. If you do not have any unique CCN locations in your facility and you don't have any baby-based locations in your facility, the counts on row three will be the same as the count for row two and the count for row one. The point being, it is acceptable to have the same counts on each row, but row two and row three cannot have counts higher than what you have submitted for row one. Um, and again, when we're looking at our MDRO and our CDI counts, we're not looking for patients who have been diagnosed or suspected or being treated for that condition. We're looking for the patients who are at risk, and that would be patients who are in specific locations. If you do have an IRF unit within your hospital, you have to provide separate denominator data so that we're able to analyze that for you. This is very similar to what you are giving for FACWIDE N. We simply ask for total patient days and total admissions. You'd go through the same process, but for location code, you would choose your rehab location rather than FACWIDE N. And we do need these two boxes of data. It should be rehab specific only, uh, and that will allow us to perform the appropriate analysis. And again, just we don't ask for encounters. Encounters are outpatient areas. <clears throat> Good news for our friends who work in long-term acute care or in freestanding IRFs. We were able to go ahead and remove the, that encounter box for you on your uh, summary fields because we don't expect long-term care facilities or freestanding IRFs to have different locations with unique CCNs or baby-based locations. We ask those facilities simply for total facility patient days and total facility admissions, and the counts that you provide for totals is what we use for MDRO and CDI as well. If you have an emergency department or a 24-hour observation location and those are on your monthly reporting plan, you have to provide specific denominator data for us to be able to analyze those as well. Uh, remember, all outpatient locations are based on encounters, not patient days. And for NHSN purposes, one encounter is one visit to the outpatient location. So as you are entering this specific data, we ask for one box, which is total encounters. Uh, we don't really tell you how to compile this. I get questions a lot of times about how should we be counting our ED? You know, is it just the total number of patients that come to an ED? Uh, can we use our registration law to count patients? Do we need to be looking at some of our accounting uh, data? We don't say how you do it because it's so different from facility to facility. What I would say to you is find the most accurate method available to you at the facility level and use that consistently month to month so that you are being compared evenly across the calendar year. If you have uh, both of these locations, we do need separate data for those. You can't say ED data for OBS or OBS data for ED. Those have to be counted separately. At the uh, last month of each quarter, when you go to submit your FACWIDE N summary data, we will ask you to give us the CDI testing methodology that you use. You'll see here I have pri highlighted primary testing method for C. difficile. And the reason I have that highlighted is because I've begun to receive a lot of questions about we use a mix of different types of testing methodologies. Um, again, it's up to the facility to determine what the correct answer to this question will be. We, when I've asked for guidance, I say, look at your volume. 
look at the tests that are run over the course of a few months and figure out what has the highest volume, what test methodology has the highest volume for that quarter, and that would be the answer that you need to provide to this testing question. It's important that you give us as accurate an answer as possible because we do risk adjust based on the answer to this question. We've always um, recommended that you select something not other. Other really was designed to just kind of help facilities when there were um, only two or three options available on the screen. As we've expanded our options, we feel like there are fewer circumstances where other would be appropriate. And we certainly uh, do not intend other to be a way for you to name specific reference testing laboratories or to give us a particular test method. Uh, and Lindsay, again, is going to talk very specifically about this very shortly. So if you make it down to this screen, you're almost there because uh, the last thing that you need to do is just to verify that you have put everything in for the month as expected. If you have report no events box checked, that is a quality check to NHSN where you are verifying that you've looked and there were no events for the month for that particular organism. I will also point out that you have these report no event boxes on your FACWIDE N denominator summary field, and then you will also find them separately on your ED and your observation wow. submissions. So if you have an event in the ED, and that's the only event that you have for the month, it goes to the ED screen, and you would have to select report no events on your FACWIDE N field to, uh, to finish up reporting for the month. That doesn't happen too often, but uh, this is just a quality check. We used to not make you do that, and, and then it was determined that it's better for you to tell us you have no events than for us to assume you didn't. I'm going to put in another plug for the Lab ID event calculator because it is a great tool. It is particularly helpful when you're, you're making decisions around the 14-day rule. I think a lot of users forget that the 14-day rule is location-specific. They want to think of it as being patient-specific, and that is not the case. It is location-specific. So every time your patient changes locations, this 14 days resets, and the calculator just shows that extremely well and makes uh, the decision as for reporting purposes much, much easier. So I want to encourage you to use that whenever you can. So in summary, we've made it very close to the end. I hope that we've stepped through the module and that you can understand the surveillance for MRSA bacteremia and C. difficile infections and why it's important. Uh, you know the requirements. You know how to set up a correct monthly reporting plan. You know the definitions, the protocols. You can enter events. You can put in lab ID event denominator data. And you have found success. Uh, and I will just remind you that it did take a little work, but the only place where success comes before work is in the dictionary, not in the real world. If you have burning questions, we're going to have a, a few minutes here to answer some, but we invite you to email us at nhsn at cdc.gov if you have specific MDRO uh, protocol questions, if you would just include that in the little summary line. It'll come straight to either myself or Dominique. Uh, if you've used before, you, perhaps you've heard back from us. And I would like to thank you for your time and your attention. and. Uh, while we are going to prepare for a tabletop exercise now, but if there are any really burning questions, step to the mic. We've got about five minutes while we set this up. We'll be happy to try to answer your questions. Denise, oops. We can start with one from the web. Okay. Do we? Mike, wherever the, over here, wherever they went to. Okay. Go ahead. 
We'll start with one from the web and come on up to the microphone if you guys want to ask. Um, question is, for FACWIDE IN, do we report MDRO for locations that we do not follow as individual units in our reporting plan also? The answer to, <laughs> the answer to that is yes. If you are doing FACWIDE IN Lab ID event reporting, it covers every inpatient location for your facility. And it doesn't matter if you want to follow it individually. It still goes into FACWIT in. My question is on CDI testing. I know you clarified and said it would be the most frequent test used. But if the most frequent test used is a NAT followed by an EIA, which is not an option, what should the facility record their test method as? I'm going to tell you to step to the side, and you and I and Lindsay are going to talk about that. Thank you. <laughs> I had to, just wanted to clarify, you had mentioned that with the patient going from inpatient to the inpatient rehab, that admission date would be that. Is it the converse true as well if they come from like an inpatient psych to inpatient? Because I've had one that's bounced back and forth and it's driving yes, me nuts. Yes, it's the first, uh, the first calendar day that the patient presents to the system, I guess, would be the way Perfect. You Thank you. Just wanted it. to make sure it was the same way for both sides. Right. Thanks. Okay. One last one. I just want to clarify with uh, facilities that have inpatient psych facilities with a different CCN, and you're counting that first most broad number, do you include the inpatient psych or you do not? You do include the inpatient psych unit for total facility patient days and total facility admissions, and then you would remove the inpatient psych counts from row 2 MDRO uh, and row 3 CDI. All right, last one. Uh, it's, it's a little bit of a two-part question. Uh, if, if I understand correctly in the way I've been doing it all along is for a MRSA or a C. diff lab ID, it's the location collected, not attributed, correct? Even if they move from another location on the same day? So for lab ID event reporting, you, the transfer rule doesn't apply. Okay. Um, you always attribute the event to the location where the positive specimen is collected. Okay, and the reason I was asking is because we're switching over to an infection control module of a DMR, and when they were explaining their version to us, they were basically applying the transfer rule to lab ID events, so I need to go back and tell them that's incorrect. Right, the transfer okay. rule does not apply to lab ID event reporting. Thank you. Sure. Okay, one more. Yes, is there any added value to the facility to do both lab ID and infection surveillance? Mm -hmm. Is there a value for this to, add, to do both of them? Is there a value? Talent? Yeah, and benefit for the facility to do both of them? I do know that there are some states that have very specific infection surveillance reporting requirements. Um, I know, for instance, C. I saw there were about 12 states that re require that to be reporting to be in compliance with state regulations. Uh, so certainly that would be something that you would want to consider if you're in a state that requires it. Um, otherwise, it's a facility choice. Uh, there's benefit. But you have to balance the resources that are available, the time required to do it, to determine if there's full benefit at the facility level. But if there's regulations from some aspect that says you need to do it, it's been my experience that that kind of drives the boat a lot of times. Am I wrong? <laughs> yeah. Denise, Thank you. do you have time for another from the web uh, or not? Yeah, we can take one more. Uh, this is from Kate Obergfell. Uh, can you please elaborate on the ERF as an inpatient for FACWIDE in? Do you need to report them twice, once under their specific facility and as an inpatient under the acute care facility? Hi, okay. Kate. Um, so if you have an inpatient rehab location within your acute care facility, it is a, a patient location for the facility, and it would count for total facility patient days, it would count for total facility admissions. 
if this unit has a unique CCN, you would remove the rehab counts from row two and row three. Uh, and then you would provide a separate denominator data for the IRF so that it can be analyzed separately because there is a different CMS reporting program for inpatient rehab facilities. Uh, so we had to come up with a mechanism where they're counted overall. You get the benefit of it from the acute care facility, but the analysis is very specific to the rehab. All right, we're going to stop with questions, and Dominique is going to take it away with our tabletop exercise. So this year we, tr we are doing something a little different, and we have roundtable discussions. So I was, as Denise was answering questions, I was trying to count the number of tables in the room. Um, this is a progressive case study, meaning that um, what you hear in the first part it, it will build as you go through the case study. Uh, I think the that there are a couple of handouts and they were placed in the center of your table. Um, they are not in your packets, if I'm not mistaken, but in the center of your table for you to share. She said she did post them so they could have printed. And they were also posted. So some of you may have printed them prior to today's session. For Lab ID, MDRO, CDF reporting, the first slide is Lab ID event or CLAPSI and starts with Mr. No Good Deed. Has everyone been able to locate a copy? If not, I have it up on the screen. And again, they are uh, available online, and the answers will be posted at a later time. So we only have a few minutes, so let's get started. So we have Mr. No Good Deed, who was helping his neighbor, Bella Rose, prune her knockout roses when her new pup playfully jumped into the garden. Startled by the pup's actions, Mr. No Good Deed cuts his arm with the pruning shears. He immediately washes the laceration and applies a protective dressing so he can continue with his good deed. Despite Mr. Deed's best efforts, four days later, he has a low-grade fever and notices the site is red and tender. Concerned the wound is infected, he visits the local hospital's ER. Due to the fever and concern for infection, he is admitted to an inpatient location, 3 East, on January 2nd. Blood cultures are collected on January 3rd, and the results are positive for MRSA. Here's our first question. This facility participates in MRSA bacteremia lab ID event reporting for FACYDN blood specimens only. Would you report the positive blood culture on 1-3 as a lab ID event? And if there are any of you who are brave enough to come to the microphone and provide us an answer, that would be great. So Denise is saying this is a group exercise, so use your colleagues uh, at your respective tables to come up with your answer. All right, All right. and just to make it interesting, I'm roaming the room, and table 14 will be providing the first answer. So table 14 says B, and they are correct. Yes, the blood culture was positive for MRSA, and here's the rationale. The positive MRSA blood culture is the per first positive for the patient and location. Okay. If the facility also performs BSI surveillance, 
what is reported. The options are A, just an MRSA lab ID event because the MRSA positive blood specimen occurred on hospital day two. I would report as MRSA bacteremia lab ID event and a BSI since the definition is met. I would not report anything. This is all a result of an unruly pup, so it is not reportable. No judgment zone. Table. <laughs> So A, and that is correct. Just an MRSA lab ID event because the MRSA positive blood specimen occurred on hospital day two. And the rationale is a single positive MRSA blood culture may be used to meet multiple definitions. This is not an HAI event because the HAI time frame is not entered. Keep in mind your HAI time frame is on or after hospital day three. Okay, so moving along, is it possible to report more than one lab ID event? The physician orders antibiotics to treat Mr. D's infections. On January 14th, he is transferred to One West and spikes a temp of 38.1 degrees Celsius on 117. Concerned with his new onset of fever, the physician orders blood cultures on 117, which are positive for MRSA. The physician then orders 14 days of vancomycin to treat his bacteremia. After 10 days of therapy, Mr. D begins to complain of severe abdominal cramps and diarrhea. His nurse asks the physician to order C. diff testing on 126, and a stool specimen is collected on that day, so January 26th. The lab calls the floor with the positive C. diff results. For fact wide in lab ID reporting, should a new lab ID event be reported? I hear a lot of discussion. Denise, have you chosen a table? I have, and the lucky table is four. four. Hey. 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 Table four says A. So lucky table number four says A, and they are correct. The facility should report both an MRSA and C. diff lab ID event. So yes, you can report more than one lab ID event. Mr. Deed has a positive blood culture that is collected on January 17th. There is also a positive C. diff stool specimen collected on January 26th. Therefore, both lab ID events are reportable. How is this MRSA lab ID event categorized? And this is for MRSA. I'm searching. We're going to table 22. All right, table 22. Do you have an answer? Table 22 says D. Oh. The correct answer is Wait, they said no, they don't agree with that. <laughs> no, they don't agree with my answer? <laughs> The correct answer is C. This event is a healthcare facility onset. Remember, lab ID reporting is specific to the patient and the location. The 14 day rule is also specific to the patient and the location of the lab ID event. The transfer to the new location, which was one west, and positive MRSA blood specimen is a new MRSA lab ID event. Re remember, a prior positive result does not influence subsequent categorization, so the prior positive on three E's does not influence this lab ID event. And if, a lab ID, if the lab ID definition is met, the event must be reported. So what is the location of attribution 
for the January 17th MRSA Lab ID event. Next to last question. After this. B. 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 They say B. The correct answer is B. So there should be 14 days with no positive blood culture result for the patient, MDRO, and location before another lab ID event is entered into NHSN for the patient. MDRO and location. Again, the rationale will remain the same. Lab ID reporting is specific to the patient and the location. The 14-day rule is specific to the patient and the location. And the transfer to the new location, which was one west, and the positive MRSA blood specimen is a new MRSA lab ID event. Again, once the definition is met, the event must be reported. Let's move on to C. diff. How is the C. diff lab ID event categorized? The I kind of hear a B. <laughs> <laughs> that is correct. Table 20, B. This is the first positive C. diff result for the location and the specimen was collected on or after hospital day four. What is the location of attribution for this C. diff lab ID event? C. That is correct. This is the first positive C. diff result for this location, which is one west. And when determining the location of attribution for a lab ID event, for lab ID event reporting, you will always use the location where the positive specimen is collected. Okay, how do I identify the lab ID event? So now after a 14-day course of flagell, Mr. Deed is transferred, the date of transfer is February 8th, to the inpatient, inpa to the inpatient rehab for general weakness and a low-grade fever. On February 11th, he has a positive MRSA blood culture and, and again is started on antibiotics. After several loose stools, an unformed specimen was collected on the 18th. This particular hospital performs multi-step testing and the results are, the following results are placed in the patient's medical record. They are GDH antigen positive, GDH toxin negative, PCR negative. Please note the IRF has a unique CCN. Which C. diff result should be used to determine if this is a lab ID event? It's brave. Are y'all brave? B. B? <laughs> that is correct. B. PCR testing is included in the CDI positive laboratory assay definition and new in 2018, Denise highlighted this, when performing multi-step testing, the final result of the last test finding, which is placed onto the patient's medical record, will determine if the CDI positive laboratory assay definition is met. Based on the CD, based on the CD lab result, is this a lab ID event for IRF? No, the crowd is saying no. <laughs> That's correct. 
the PCR, the PCR test was negative, so this is not a lab ID event. The PCR test was the last test performed in the multi-step testing, and the result was negative. Therefore, the CDI laboratory definition is not met, and this is not a reportable CD, CDIF lab ID event. What date should the IP enter as the admission date to IRF? A, that's correct. For NHSM reporting purposes, as highlighted during the presentation, transfers to IRF are considered a continuous stay. This would also apply to your inpatient psychiatric facilities. Rehab events are a part of fact widening and reporting for acute care facility, but are removed from the acute care facility during analysis. Analysis is then performed on IRF events only. We're coming to the end. How would a lab ID event occurring on IRF affect the acute care facilities SIR? Again, note, this IRL has a unique CCN. We're going to let Lindsay answer this one. Where is she? <laughs> she stepped away. Darn. What do you think? Okay. Mm -hmm. The correct answer is B. This lab ID event is analyzed separately since the event occurred on IRF. And again, re when reporting these events, rehab events are a part of FACYN reporting for the acute care facility. However, these events are removed from the acute care facility during analysis. Analysis is then performed on IRF events only, which is separate and individual from the acute care facility. Okay, and this is the message Denise and I want you to remember. Just keep shining. Thank you. <laughs>